Father, we thank you for the reading of your word today. We thank you for your word, which is so rich. And uh, Lord, as we come to the study of your word today, speak through the pages of scripture to us that we might apply the truth wisely to our lives. Father, the days in which we're living are perilous times, uh, but Father, you have equipped us for everything, not only that we would stand, but as was read, that we would persevere in prayer and in uh, trust in you. And we lift this prayer in, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, everything was good. In fact, everything was great. Adam was created by God and he was indeed blessed. He was given authority over all of the rest of created uh, order on this earth. God in his loving care and mercy saw the need that Adam had for a helpmate and he provided one in Eve. Adam and Eve, they lived in a perfect environment. The two of them lacked nothing. Water came from the ground to nourish uh, the land, and it was an immaculate garden in which they lived. Everything was beautiful and flawless, and then everything changed. There was an invasion, a subtle invasion. It came in the form of a serpent, which happened to be a lesser order of creation than mankind. Satan took possession of the serpent, and he suggested that God was not good, that it was okay to disobey God, and that God's word was not reliable. And that serpent was Satan's instrument to persuade Adam and Eve to make decisions that had devastating consequences. His intent was to separate man from God. And Adam took the bait, rebelled against God, and the result of that was sin entered the world. But you know, sin did not begin at that point. Sin arose a good time, a long time before that. In the classic book, The Invisible War, Donald Gray Barnhouse writes of the origin of this continuing spiritual warfare. And while I don't concur with everything that Barnhouse includes in his book, he is right and does accurately depict the reality of spiritual warfare, referencing Ezekiel 28, Barnell's writes where Satan is figuratively represented as the king of Tyre. And he notes that Satan also created in beauty, a creature, not a God, a creature, rebelled in the heavens against God. And the result of that was that Satan and a host were cast down from heaven, some still in chains to this day, as we see in Jude 6 but also others who are at work today, even as I speak, trying to cloud the truth of God, trying to lead people to rebel against God, trying to lead people to doubt that indeed there is a spiritual and cosmic conflict that is going on that has repercussions on this earth. So Paul addresses this situation here as he prepares to close his letter to the Ephesians. And he gives some final words of instruction to the church. I really appreciate that John and Renee included um, sort of uh, select verses uh, from uh, our study here in these weeks. And you remember we div have divided our study into two parts. The first uh, three chapters really dealt with the blessing of being a Christian and, and the truth, the doctrinal truth of what it means to be in right relationship with Christ. And then these last three chapters we've been looking to most recently focus on uh, what it means to us, the responsibility in the Christian life. We just completed uh, three weeks noting the believer's responsibility in the home. And one thing we noted during the three weeks of study is that we need a God consciousness in all that we do, not just in the family, but in everything. Yet we know also there's an operative at work to whom we also must be conscious he desires that individuals and as we will see nations submit to his lesser diabolical plans not the lord but the devil he's inferior to god 
He doesn't even like what we're preparing to study today and would do anything to distract us, anything to cause a disturbance. He does have an influence in this world and we see evidence of it all around us. But we as followers of Jesus Christ, we're not left alone in this battle. We're made aware of his methods and, and we're equipped to win in this spiritual battle. So for the next two weeks, we're gonna be looking at the subject of spiritual warfare. And we really must begin at this point, and we will today, and we'll see clear scriptural examples of this warfare. Concrete examples written in black and white in the word of God that help us to understand that yes, indeed, there is this conflict. But the, also this morning, we're gonna look at the plan that we as Christians are given uh, to triumph in this particular conflict. And then today we'll conclude by looking at a few of the offensive weapons that God gives us in this battle. And then next week, uh, our desire is to, to close the study by looking at the Christian's defensive weapons. But first this morning, as, as we begin our study in these verses that we just read a, a few moments ago, I want to note some scriptural references that prove the reality of this spiritual conflict, the reality of what Satan desires to do. You know, as many of you may know, unlike uh, Bob, who's a Philadelphia Eagles fan, and Kemper, who's a Dallas Cowboy fan, I'm a Washington professional team fan. I still call them the Redskins. I hear Larry's amen in that. But you know, being a, a Washington fan has been difficult. Uh, Carl's one, he knows what I'm saying. Been difficult here uh, lately. Uh, they try to change our name. Chris, he's a wash, fellow Washingtonian. Um, and there have been lots of things that have gone on. And one thing is the name of the mascot had to be changed because it was offensive. <laughs> then I began to think being a preacher I'm not justifying or, or refuting that. I'm just going to speak logically. Have you ever noticed how many schools and teams have the name devils, demons? My, my, my uh, arch rival was out of Rustburg. They were called the Red Devils. Have you ever noticed nobody's ever offended by that? Isn't that shocking? Think about that. Just stop and you know why? because most people think he's a fictional character. They think it's like a cartoon. They think he just dresses in a red suit with a pitchfork in his hands and these crazy looking ears. The world today believes that the devil is a fictional character, but he's not. He came as a serpent to Adam the New Testament tells us that he comes deceitfully as an angel of light. He is the source of conflict. Do you see any conflict? I guarantee you he's in it. He's real and the Bible affirms it in many places. The Bible does not leave any doubt that he's real. Now we're going to look at four illustrations of that because I only have about a half an hour here. But this is just a brief representation of the number of times in scripture that it teaches about the reality of the battle between darkness and light, the realm of God who is far greater and the lesser power, the devil. I wanna look at these four texts as scriptural affirmation of the fact that we're in spiritual battle. Jude 9, Jude is a tiny book in the New Testament. Our ladies are studying it on Monday night. It has one chapter, so you don't say Jude chapter one, verse nine, you just say Jude, verse 9. But, but in verse 9, there's something that's very interesting that is written there. And it says that Michael, the archangel, as we'll see, the warrior angel is in conflict with the devil over Moses' body. You can read that in Jude 9. 
Now, a lot of people uh, might debate what this conflict is over. I, I tend to believe uh, this, that there was a conflict over where uh, uh, Moses' body was located because the devil would have wanted nothing more than for people to have found his bones, to have found his body, and set it up as a monument to be worshipped as an idol. And, and that's what I believe is what this conflict was over. But regardless of what the conflict was over, we see that there was a conflict between an archangel and the devil, and Michael says to him, the Lord rebuke you. Secondly, Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. Daniel was praying. However, an angel was delayed for 21 days or three weeks from coming to Daniel. And the angel who arrived reasoned as to why he had been hindered in coming in a timely way. And he said that he was in conflict with the king of Persia, which is a symbolic representation of the devil. But we see that Michael, the archangel, came to his aid and assisted him. Again, a scriptural illustration of the reality of the spiritual conflict between uh, God's kingdom and the devil. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 and following, a favorite for a number of people in our church. Elisha was with the people of God. They were facing a vast army from Aramea, and this army instilled fear in Elisha's men. And he realized that they were fearful. And so Elisha offered a brief prayer uh, to God. And he said, open their eyes that they might see what is before them. They opened their eyes and they saw a vast army. But it was not a physical army. It was a spiritual army that fought for them and delivered them. And then there's Job, chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. Let's make no mistake. We acknowledge that the devil has a power, but God has ultimate power. So in Job chapter 1, we read of a dialogue between the devil and, and God. And the devil is basically saying, Job is just serving you because you blessed his life. You're giving him all this thing, all of these things, and that's why he's serving. But if you take it away from him, he'll turn from you. Well, God knew his servant, his son Job. And so he allowed Satan to bring about a lot of difficulty, terrible difficulty in Job's life. Now, I don't understand all about that dialogue. I believe that it truly happened, and we saw and we see earthly evidence of what the devil is seeking to do. And it says there in Job 1 that he was roaming over the earth. Now, I don't say that, Christian, to instill fear in you because we're going to see in a moment that while he has a power, he has no power over you unless you relinquish the power that you have. And he really can, as we see in Job, touch the depth of your being, but he is not a fictional character. D.L. Moody said, experience, and I quote, experience in both the personal life and the cultural life, that means in society in general, reveal actions that can be attributed neither to God or to man. And so we look at what Hitler did. We look at what's going on with Russia and what they're doing. And, and they, they give evidence to the fact that there's an operative beneath and behind what we see. And that operative is the chief of darkness, the devil. So scripture attests to the battle. He's real. But what is our plan to victoriously engage in this conflict? Well, Paul doesn't leave us uninformed. And I want to look at a, a brief, a simple four-step plan. Now, it's simple to understand. We'll see it's not so simple to apply because we must take seriously uh, this. But the first thing is this, and we've already talked about in the simple plan, know that spiritual warfare is a real thing. Look at verse 12. For our struggle, Paul identifies himself with that struggle. 
is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces. Where on the earth? No, in the heavens. We've seen already there's a conflict. We've seen four scriptures in uh, the Bible that teach us the truth. And, and Paul is saying here that this battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against person to person. It's not just a physical thing, but there's a source behind it. And a big mistake is to ignore this instruction that Paul is giving us here. To say, well, Paul is just speaking his opinion. No, Paul is speaking the word of God and he said there is a struggle and it is not a fleshly struggle. And there are powers that, beyond, that are beyond what we see uh, that are engaged seeking to come against the individual, against the church, seeking to come against the community, against the nation. Many of y'all know Ben Lehman. He's been one of my mentors in the faith. Ben's a little more outspoken than I am, a little stronger personality, loves the Lord, been an example to me in Christ. I've shared before, I believe he would witness to a signpost. Uh, he uh, retired from the ministry and he's an Uber driver and his whole reason for driving Uber, he said, I called him one day, it was like one o'clock in the afternoon. He said, Rick, I've already witnessed to eight people today. He said, they get in my car and I start sharing Jesus with them. When Ben was discipling Karen and me in personal evangelism, he shared something I haven't forgotten. He said, Rick, whenever I am preparing to go to share door to door on that night, I can guarantee you I'll have a flat tire, I'll stub my toe, I'll trip, uh, my kids will get on my nerves. He said, you can count on it. And he said, it's not coincidence. He said, that's spiritual warfare. Now, I'm not saying look at the thing that stubs your toe as being the devil. I'm not saying look at your wife or your husband if he or she gets on your nerves and saying that. What I'm saying is the devil does not want us to live for God, to do godly things. He'll distract. So no, spiritual warfare is a real thing. Secondly, stay humble. Stay humble. What was it that led to the devil's downfall in the beginning was pride. How do you fight pride as a Christian? Stay humble. I'm excited for the ladies in the study. Uh, I never realized you could do so much study in one chapter of the Bible, but they, it's, it's been a great study. I, I know for them, Karen's been working on it. But it's something that's very interesting, that illustration out of Jude 9. Here was Michael, the archangel, the warrior angel, and it's said that, that he didn't even try to blaspheme the devil. He said, the Lord rebuke you. And what that is speaking toward is humility, of realizing that as great as Michael was, he needed to call upon a greater power in this battle. And so he said, the Lord rebuke you. Listen, you can't fight spiritual battles alone. You can't fight it in your strength, in your wisdom, in your power. You need a power who is beyond you, the power of God in your life. So stay humble. Stay humble. Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, I know uh, uh, Bob likes around that 10, 12, and 13, but in verse 12 it says, Be careful if you think you stand, lest you fall. Be alert, be humble. But then there's a third thing. Know, Christian, that you do have a greater resource. You have a greater resource. Michael could say the Lord rebuke you because he knew that he had a greater resource, which was God himself. In Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 13, there was this magician named Simon. He did some amazing things from the powers of the darkness. And so he was there, but then the disciples came and he found a greater power than he had, and he wanted that power because he realized, I may have a power, but this power is beyond what I have. Before we look at the greater power, which is important to know, it's important for us to know that we're not to dabble in the lesser power, 
the power of darkness, Ouija boards, seances, even simple things like horoscopes, stay away from them. Don't be near them. You say, well, well, a horoscope's, you know, it's just innocuous. It's not much to that. No, you know, if, if I know I'm going to get hurt on the street, I'm not going to see how close I get to that street to see if I'm going to be hurt. Many people have been taken into darkness not realizing that you cannot dabble in that. And I speak to young people today. Stay away from it. It may intrigue you, but guess what? There was a man, Simon himself, who did a lot of power, powerful things. When he saw God, he said, this power I'm dabbling with is not the power that God has. Look at verse 10. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. I'm telling you today, God has a power that will amaze you, that should amaze you. God is doing works that you and I cannot even fathom. People are coming to know him. The gospel is advancing. Know that you have a greater resource. In Ephesians chapter 1, earlier in this epistle, the scripture says that God exercised his power in Christ by raising him from the dead, and not just raising him to, from the dead, but seating him at the right hands in the, in the heavens, in the position of authority, far above what? Every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but in the one to come. What does that say? You have a greater power if you're a believer. 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. Christian, you don't need to fear the power of the devil. You need to acknowledge that it exists. But God has giving, given you everything you need. But then there's a fourth step to this plan. Apply what you know and you have. Apply it. Look at verse 11. Put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Put on that power. Look to God. A lot of you, maybe you get those notices, a recall. When you get that recall, you're not to put that down in your desk and say, well, I'll just wing it. No, you apply it. You do what it says. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Jehoshaphat had a problem. Again, a vast army was coming against him of not just one people group, but multiple. It seemed hopeless. He took the situation to God. God delivered him and the people, and all they had to do was sing. They were singing. They didn't wield one weapon, but they did stand, and they did have to do something. The scripture says that if you and I are going to engage in this battle, we must do something. And it tells us there that we must put on the full armor of God. The fact that it is given as a command means that it's possible not to put on the full armor of God, but we need it. And we're going to see there are positive, aggressive, offensive parts of the armor, and then there are defensive parts of the armor. Today, we're going to first look at the Christian's offensive weaponry in spiritual conflict. Look at verse 13. For this reason, take up the full armor of God. Why? So that you may be able to resist. And resist speaks about standing strong. It's not like I'm resisting, avoiding. It speaks more in an active way of standing, uh, of resisting, standing against in the evil day. Now, we know the day of the Lord is a single day. This evil day is speaking representative of any time when you will be tempted, when you will be challenged, when you will be discouraged by the devil in this battle that you must stand. So we see three aspects of our offensive weaponry. And we'll just look at these briefly before we close this morning. We'll come back next week. First, we see the message of the gospel. 
The scripture calls it the gospel of peace. It is peace with God. But the gospel is advancing. And wherever you would see the gospel advancing, especially in the book of Acts, the world would fight against it. We've looked at a couple of times how Paul was in jail in Philippi because of sharing the gospel. There was conflict. But it is the gospel of peace, the, 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 the gospel of peace with God. And we're to have our feet shod with the gospel, not running away, but running forward in this battle. I loved uh, our speaker uh, that we had this week, godly guy, and I know he's had an impact on, on Matt's life. Uh, Dan was a blessing to be around. The last night we, we were watching the ball game and we just turned down the TV and just started talking about everything. And, and he had a wealth of knowledge and but early in the day, he and I were talking, and he said, you know, Rick, you just got to keep preaching the gospel over and over and over again. Because some people, it may take seven times, it may take 10 times, it may take 14 times. The gospel is a message that brings power, and the, and the gospel needs to be the center of the ministry of the church. In Matthew 16, Jesus was in dialogue with Peter, and, and Peter pleased God by declaring Jesus as the Messiah. And God said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, Peter's name meant rock, but I don't think he meant solely what Peter, who Peter was, but he meant what Peter said. What was Peter's message? Jesus is the Messiah. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against the gospel of peace. There's a power in advancing the gospel. Our feet are to take the gospel to this community. This community needs to hear that Jesus loves them, needs to hear that you need Jesus. We're to proclaim salvation through Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ alone, there's none but he. We're to be a shining light with the gospel in a world of darkness. Paul describes in Romans 1, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, the Jew first and then the Greek. So we go out in our communities. I cannot remember a time in the last decade when we are so equipped with activities to communicate the gospel as we have coming up these next couple of months. Um, the drama team that is coming Good Friday, all of us should be there. And if you have a friend that doesn't know the Lord, bring them. The, 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 the crucifixion is going to be depicted. The gospel is going to be presented. Easter Sunday, we're going to be in that beautiful new facility, and we're going to be preaching the resurrection of Christ. An outdoor service that we're seeking to develop May 21st, and it's already in the works, has as its intent that we invite the community to come out and to hear the gospel. And then every spring, through our, our recreation committee, we have that pig picking and that get together, and all of that is set for us to rub shoulders with people who don't know Christ. Why is that? Because where light prevails, darkness wanes. What are you doing to take the gospel to others? But then I want you to see a second thing, the written word of God. John and Renee read about it. It is the sword the Spirit uses, we see in verse 17. Word here translates the Greek word rhema, which is different from law, guys. It speaks to the utterance of God. God can speak this word in a time of need spiritually. It can refer to spiritual, scriptural teaching, a preached word or the like, a word that is said or expressed. It is written in black and white before us, those of us who have the word open this morning. And it can speak to any form and in any form of presentation. Believer, you have the word. Are you engaged in the study of the word, applying the word? After Jesus' baptism, Jesus was driven to the wilderness by the Spirit, at which place we read he was tempted three times of the devil. And each time Jesus answered positively 
with the Word of God. Is the Word of God in your life? Is it in your heart? Do you take time each day at the beginning of the day to read the Word of God? If Satan strikes you with doubt, respond by the Word of faith. If he tempts you to sin, respond reaffirming the commands of God in your life. If he tries to discourage you, go to a verse of hope. God desires you and I read, study, and apply the word. The written word of God in our heart is a powerful, offensive tool the Spirit uses in spiritual conflict. But then thirdly, prayer. Prayer may be the greatest weapon we have. Now I would say equally with the word of God. Paul writes, pray. Pray at all times. Pray at all times in the spirit. We're to stay in prayer. Our prayer is to be led by God himself. We're to pray with every prayer and request. Prayer is that general word for prayer. Request deals with specific petitions. Every request. Petitioning God, his mercy, his grace, his strength, his power. In intercession for all the saints, intercessory prayer. Prayer not, may not be listed like the breastplate of righteousness as a specific uh, article that is put on, but prayer prevails in all of the Christian's life. It's the offensive weapon for the Christian. In our recent midweek study, the kings of Judah on Wednesday evenings, Back in the fall, we were introduced to some great kings, some good kings, and some not-so-good kings in Judah. Hezekiah was one of the great kings. He didn't have a good father, but he was a great king. One day, the wicked leader, Sennacherib, a wicked Assyrian leader, threatened Hezekiah and the people of God. And basically, the para I could paraphrase it, he said, Hezekiah, there's nothing you're going to do about this. I'm going to annihilate you and I'm going to annihilate all of your people. And humanly speaking, everything was bleak. However, Hezekiah took that letter that came from the hand of Sennacherib. He laid it on the ground in the temple, and he prayed to the Lord. And God heard that prayer. Seemingly impossible situation. Prayer set God on the offensive, and God said, you know what, I'm going to put a hook in that guy's nose and I'm gonna drag him where he wants to be. And when I drag him, I'm gonna scare him so much they're gonna flee. 180,000 people fled. And they didn't even have to sing a song that time. God did it. God did it. The point of that story, which is a true account, is this. Prayer is your great resource in spiritual conflict. Sometimes you say, God, I can't fix it. Will you? Do you pray for your children, for your spouse, for your church, your community? Do you pray for your nation, this world? You should. There's a verse in closing that I like. It's found in Hebrews. Hebrews 10, 39. It makes a statement. It's not a promise. It is a statement, a profound statement, and it speaks of the Christian. And it says this, we are not those who draw back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and are saved. I like that. We're winners. We're not those who draw back. We're not those who draw back in fear. We're not those who draw back and are destroyed, but we have faith. We're saved. Listen, in this world we're living, there's a battle. I've never lived in confusing days like this. We are living in a confused and confusing world. But God is strong. Pray. Stand on what the Word says, not what the culture says. Stand in the strength of the Lord Himself, clinging to Him alone. Take your stand. Take the gospel. Wherever there's darkness, take the light of the gospel. 
Apply God's word to your own life in times of testing and trial and temptation. Take that word to fellow Christians. We need fellow Christians who, uh, who lift each other up. I was laughing, and I'll close with this. Yesterday, as youth, they have fun games, and they had these little pellets. And the Don't worry, parents. It wouldn't hurt anybody. All right, they had goggles on. Let's not get upset. And so they're running like a gauntlet. They're running through and they're firing at them. And then as youth, after about three or four times, they get bored and they start becoming creative. So one guy acted like somebody was wounded and he grabbed him and started running across. And it was the funniest thing I think I saw all day. But it's a picture of us Christians. Do you know somebody discouraged? Maybe in that battle, you need to pick them up. Encourage them with the word of God, the gospel of peace. Bring them along in prayer actively, continually calling upon God. Let's pray. Father, um, we've seen in the scripture and we know in our own lives that this battle is not pretend or fictional. It's real. There are things that are going on that we may not see with the physical eye, but, but are as real as we are here today. Father, we thank you for your word, which equips us for this fourfold plan. We thank you for the weapons, both offensive and defensive, that you give to us abundantly. Lord, I pray for our families, protect them, I pray for our church, Lord, protect it. But I pray also for our families and our church that we would not just defensively seek your protection, but that, Lord, we would actively in faith be praying and taking the gospel out to others. Lord, I pray for our young people today. I thank you for them. All of the potential in the world. But Lord, as they heard this weekend, those who were there, apart from you, apart from what you're doing, this life is empty. And that message for them applies to all of us. We thank you for Jesus who lived a perfect life and died a perfect death and rose again. And Lord, as we prepare our hearts for this season of resurrection, May we be faithful to share the gospel of peace. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.